welcome to A State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. Thank you so much for tuning in. A few announcements. We have a new website for the podcast, astateofmindpodcast.com. And that is a great place to send us questions, comments, uh, feedback. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please consider throwing us a donation. Even five or ten dollars makes a big difference. You can do that at patreon.com backslash a state of mind. And there's some different levels of support that you can provide there. And on the note of receiving feedback, I've heard from a number of you about the spiritual teacher Ratu Bagus, if I am pronouncing that correctly. And I um, learned that he recently died. You know, and it's always sad when someone dies. You know, I've heard from a lot of you about the positive impact that he and his teachings and his community have had on your life. And so a little less than a year ago on this podcast, I had an episode with Samantha Emmett, and she shared more negative experiences that she had with Ratu and with the community there. And so it's put me in a little bit of a funny situation, but I hear you and I, I fully believe that a lot of people really benefited from what he was doing and what he was teaching. And so I think I will have another episode sharing some different perspectives on Ratu and what he was about. So look out for that in the future. And thank you for writing to me. So transitioning to today's episode, today I'm speaking with Daryl Duane. And Daryl is, you know, I think he's someone who, as he puts it, wears a lot of different hats, plays a lot of different roles in his life. Today in our conversation, I'm mainly speaking with him in his role as a community organizer. And I think in that role, he he really excels. He's, he's just really good at it. <laughs> um, one of the things he said to me in our conversation was that 5,000 friends just isn't enough for him on Facebook. And we, we just, we cover a lot of different topics. Uh, he actually helped me with the show notes for this episode. So I really encourage you to look at those, check them out. There's a lot of different links and a lot of different resources down there. And I actually met Daryl in 2013 at Burning Man. Uh, he calls himself a co-founder and instigator of Camp Contact. It's a camp that I stayed at. It's just a really special place, you know, with all the... There's so many different things, of course, that you could say about Burning Man. Um, I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And at Camp Contact, um, it's named in part after Contact Dance. So they offer contact improv dance. They also offer workshops around things like authentic relating, you know, communicating more fully with people. Uh, as well as meditation and yoga. And I actually taught some workshops on meditation as well as yoga there. And I share a story about that with Daryl in our conversation. So I have fond memories of Camp Contact and what they're about. And I hope that Burning Man will return next year. It's officially not happening this year, unfortunately, because of COVID. So if you are interested in Burning Man or at least this side of it, I think this conversation will be of interest to you. Uh, In addition to that, we just cover a lot of other topics Daryl shares a bit about his life and his upbringing, and we talk about Burning Man and the principles in which it's founded. Um, Daryl's also an expert in cryptocurrency. He shares a little bit about that. We talk about psychedelics and the potentials of psychedelic assisted therapy and their role in healing and in spiritual experiences, um, the war on drugs, the problems with the for-profit healthcare industry. He shares a bit about the STOA online community of thinkers and thought leaders, which uh, I thought was interesting. Um, So again, check out the show notes for a bunch of links and resources. This was a great conversation, and we definitely cover a lot of ground. Without further ado, I bring you Daryl Duane. Daryl, thanks for being on the podcast. I'm glad to be here, Julian. Yeah, it's good to have you. And um, just to kind of set the stage here a little bit, I reached out to you to be on the podcast in part because I had some people ask me, like, hey, could you have a podcast that talks about Burning Man a little bit and what's going on there and what that's about? And um, that's how I met you. That's so we right. can get into that uh, later. But I kind of wanted to just ask you about, yeah, if you wanted to introduce yourself and yeah. How would you describe what you do? (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, so I I know you from Camp Contact, uh, the camp that I organized at Burning Man, uh, and and at other other regional events here on the East Coast, uh, based here in Washington D.C. And uh, so so I do a lot of organizing, and and community organizing has been a big 
big team in my life. I've, I've been doing it um, from you know when I was a kid and building forts together with my <laughs> my neighbors and uh, and so on on, on up through there. We can talk more about that, but um, but yeah, um, I, as far as the Burning Man, Man world, I, I have a number of different roles. I've been going since two thousand four, although I had tickets in nineteen ninety nine, but I was I was too scared oh. to go. Oh well, and, uh, didn't know anybody there, and didn't really uh, know how that would go to go all the way from the East Coast out to some place where. I, but I was really yeah. fascinated to go. Uh, so eventually, I, I met some friends and found some other people that were going uh, from uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church, where I was uh, very active with in the young adult community. And I found a camp. I found uh, the fire department camp, uh, Black Rock City Volunteer Fire. Department, uh, and I was already a volunteer firefighter in, in Fairfax, Virginia, so it was a natural <laughs> progression to to go ahead and and spend three uh, three years uh, for my first three years uh, with that camp. That's amazing. So, so you've have you gone every year since two thousand four? I, I have. Uh, That's amazing. Yes, I have, and I've, I've pretty much gone early every year <clears throat> and, and stayed somewhat late every every year. So it's been oh well, been nice to dive in. I have not gone in two thousand twenty, and, and I. Don't plan on going in 2021 either. But right. Not, that was a, a bit of the impetus to this conversation that it's obviously it was canceled because of the pandemic, and then it sounds like it's not officially not happening again. Yes, right. It's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, and you just mentioned Black Rock City. For those who don't know, that's the name of the little city that's created. It's not that little, actually. Right? It's pretty big. It's the, like something like the sixth largest city in Nevada that we could have happened. Something that's more in there. for one so week, so, right? Yeah, uh, seventy, eighty thousand people. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and then it sounds like you have been inspired with this, like community organizing, bringing people together since the time you were a kid. Yes. Yeah. I knew like in high school, um, I didn't have a language for it, but I had some idea that I, I wanted to start a cult and I, I don't really want to start <laughs> a cult. If I would do anything, I want to start the anti-cult. I love that. I love that you just said that. <laughs> yeah, no, let's be real. Uh, but that's, that was, that was what I was thinking. That was, I knew like I wanted cult, to like, at, So at that time, was your thinking like to create an organization of shared beliefs? Like how, how what did cult mean to you back then? Yeah, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't really clear, but I knew I want, I knew that I loved community. I knew that I loved uh, working with people and, and allowing things to happen. And uh, um, right around, this would have been 85, 86, the internet wasn't readily available to people, hmm. but people were joining bulletin board systems, BBSs. Oh, what is and that? And so I... Like an yeah, actual bulletin board? No, so sorry. These are not actual bulletin boards. Okay. These are uh, you'd have so you'd have your modem on your computer, and then you would dial into somebody else's modem, yeah. and then that modem would, would answer, and you, you could see message boards. Yeah. Uh, and there was no real graphics or or certainly no video, but you could write and leave messages, um, sort of the way maybe a Reddit works now. But okay. very, very, very low tech, and really only one person could be on it at a time. So, so this you is dial back in the day when you when you had to use your phone line to get on the internet. And, you you know, did, yeah. And for, for people, had, people who are born uh, more recently can't even imagine this ancient history. That's thing. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started one. So I started a bulletin board system. Uh, I, I called it the power supply, and people could dial in and and. This is open source software that allowed people to leave messages. And it was nice. I could go on at the same time, so I could chat with them. Um, and, and then some, some of the <coughs> better ones did have more than one modem, so you could dial in and, and have interactive chats. But typically, the hobbyist would just have one extra phone line they could dedicate where people could dial in. And then you leave a message, and then you hang up. Somebody else dials in. And then every night, you come down, and you like dial all the ones to see which one you can get on first. And then chat away or leave, leave messages and then we'd have parties. And so I think it was a pretty new thing to like have a gathering where people would come where you hadn't met them face to face or at least on the telephone. Oh, interesting. Where people came to gatherings that you only knew from typing, typewritten or at least computer based interactions. So certainly I imagine some people would meet through, through um, mailings or, or letters, but uh, 
yeah, and that was interesting and 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 a bit intimidating at the same time. That's yeah, that's fascinating that um, this message board on this new kind of connection on a computer could bring people together in some place in the future. <laughs> yeah, and obviously that can happen now in amazing ways, like some of the protests I think that have been organized around the world or social movements. Um, you know, I think it's just. We take it for granted, or it is, it is like who hasn't done that is, is the question now. You know, unless you don't have a have data access. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've always been um, more of a, a technology person too. Been, been certainly been a tech person. My my dad was an electrical engineer and got me going with computers in in 1978 or so, 77. Wow. Uh, CPM machines. And which is a kind of precursor to to DOS, and uh, yeah, and then I took a summer school class using HP computers, learned BASIC and Pilot and different programming stuff. So yeah, from an early age. Interesting. <laughs> and then, um, and you you mentioned the Unitarian Universalist Church. Was that a big part of your life? It was. Yeah, I, I grew up Presbyterian. Um, but I didn't really resonate a whole lot with with the, the Christian stories and 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 the faith and and it was interesting. I was I was fascinated by it was because it was a community. Uh, but in college, I was lucky to find the Unitarian Church in, in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, my oh. physics professor was the president there, and that was kind of cool to see him at the church and see. Oh, look, science is you know there is a home for scientists to to. Um, to still have a faith tradition. Interesting, yeah. And that's like a, I don't know, I guess I don't know a lot about it, but just that it's very, um, obviously universal, that it's like welcoming of everyone. Like how would it, you? Uh, yeah. Radical, or sorry, radical inclusion is the Burning Man uh, principle. <laughs> um, the inherent worth and dignity of every individual is uh, is mm. the is the, the, the Unitarian Universalist principle that nice. um, is, is really key in that realm. And then, um, like fast forwarding to Burning Man and Camp Contact, like that really is a attempt to create a community that has deeper intentions there. I mean, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it seems sure. like there's a connection there with your interests with spirituality and certainly. And, and you know, I got as close to I, I came very close to becoming a minister. I I went to some oh, well. prospective student days uh, at uh, Wellesley here in D.C. and at the Meadville Lombard. Uh, theological seminary in in Chicago, thinking I would want to be a, a minister, and then I did find Burning Man. And I was like, "Wow, this is a different kind of of ministry." I'd rather I think this is more more of my alley, and I can get my desires to create community met through through bur the burner community and uh, and adjuncts to that. Um, so yeah, the the first uh, couple of years of Burning Man, I discovered contact improvisation dance. Oh, cool. And that, that really blew my mind, uh, seeing people dancing in center camp. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I I knew I found something really special. And I would go to the regional events, the regional Burning Man events here on the East Coast, Playa del Fuego and so forth, and, and would enjoy the burner community there, but be like, hey, where is where's the contact dance? Where's, where's the <laughs> yoga? Where's the embodiment? Uh, and that was about the time I also, because of the movement, I started having a kind of a Kundalini awakening, if you will. And that's where I uh, really decided embodiment was uh, a key part of my mission or part of my, my, my consciousness. And I, I, yeah. this whole new frontier of awareness came to me uh, in my body. And so I was like, I told my girlfriend at the time, Hey, next year, I want to start a camp. Let's make a, a contact camp. And and sure enough, a year later, um, I had got a dome built with friends, and uh, we, we came to Playa del Fuego in 2007 with, with what is now the first time that Camp Contact gathered. That's and so cool. had a nice yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, so for, the, yeah, I love that. It's just this, um, the things that brought you to Burning Man and moved you and why you wanted to create a camp are like around community building and this, like spirituality, use the word ministry. Connecting yes. with people, yeah. um, getting in touch with your body, like this more somatic awareness. Absolutely. That's so important and, and yeah. so needed in our society. So I, think, I just think that's, that's beautiful. And um, for those who don't know, like contact dance is a dance form where you main, basically maintain a point of contact. 
But I've heard it described like you don't even have to maintain physical contact. It could be eye contact or... And there's traditionally, when you do that, there's no music, right? It's just um, like a hardwood floor and people moving in space and it can be very powerful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and there's no, there's no right or wrong, which is something that I appreciate about it. It is a very open ontological space. It is a place for, for a lot of exploration. And, and you can think of it as there, there's comparisons to how an infant uh, is when they're first um, mm. coming into their own somatic awareness. And so we bring ourselves back to that, that state as we dance at, at times. And that, that's huge. That's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly been something that's been talked about on this podcast frequently. It's like how individualized we are as a culture here in America. And the cost of that can be, you know, increasing sense of isolation, even alienation. Um, there's a tremendous desire for community. And I think Burning Man really speaks to that. I mean, I think that's why it exists. And it's this flowering of community that's temporary. It comes together and then it dissolves. Um, I, I would say in general, the people that go tend to be very individualistic and kind of, I what is the word? Icon, iconoclast, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, like willing to be themselves. I mean, that's kind of the whole point. Yeah. But this this idea that you can be a unique, independent, powerful individual and in community, and that's that this beautiful duality, this beautiful polarity that's interesting to think about and play with. And yeah, I'm, I'm really get, I really get tired of people saying, "Oh, we need more freedom," or "Oh, we need more social cohesion." Hmm. Like, we need, we need better of both. Then they, they, they go together. They have both. They yeah. Together. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Cause it often gets, you know, like more communal societies often get contrasted with our society, which is more individualistic. And I like that. I like that idea that it can, that could actually support each other. And that Why can't um, we have our cake and eat it too, in a way. And, and yeah. you can't always there, there's, but, but I want different, I want better measures. I, I don't, I want, uh, I want better <laughs> ways of, of advancing both threads because we, we as humans and, and we as society need both. Uh, I recently learned that the, the sixth love language is, is distance. Oh, wow. Have you, yeah. Have you heard this before? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've heard that. I like that okay. though. Yeah. The, the respecting distance, taking space. You know, I did hear, I had a friend um, here in uh, Colorado who went around and interviewed all the uh, couples that they really admired. They're like, you guys have, seem like you have an amazing relationship like what are your secrets and they did like a kind of semi-formal interview process and they found that one thing they all had in common was that they would almost all of them would intentionally take space apart for about a week or so or several days at a time and yeah. and have like no contact for a few days yeah. and then they would come back together and uh, i think that speaks to what you're saying right there <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah i don't want to i feel like <laughs> Come back to the subject of Burning Man. Like it's something that is maybe easy to make fun of, and it's it's amazing how yeah. it's it's become so popular and, and part of our popular culture. It's it's in the popular consciousness for better or worse, and uh, I think it's a good thing overall. And I think you know people are going to have their ideas, their preconceptions. They're going to be different for if you've actually gone and experienced it. Like I, I feel fortunate that I got to go. Obviously, you've been a lot, but I think it just one of the things about it that I want to speak to that just totally blows me away is in our very capitalistic, individualistic society, um, like you just described your piece of like going and creating a camp and building a dome in the desert. I don't think people listening may not realize the incredible amount of energy and work that that takes. And so for yeah. thousands of people to come together and put so much work and money and energy into creating the city that just lasts a week, yeah. um, it really is just mind blowing and amazing. And it goes against the, current of so much of what we would expect because when you're there there's no money exchange for example um, it's just story. it's yeah. not a um people are not doing this i mean people have all their different motives of course but generally speaking people aren't doing this to to make money for example i mean that motive really isn't there i, I don't think maybe it no, could be in some it, shadow it ways but it gets yeah. washed pretty fast if, if yeah if, if someone sees some kind of commercialism that gets called out yeah yeah, so I just, I mean, and that's just like one piece of it, and, and just, I don't know, I don't even know what words to put to it or how to say it, but that that feels like a very big part that's so different from any other event I've ever been to, right? Like, you go there and there's yeah. not, you're, people are cooking food and handing it to people that they don't know, and that yes. experience is so touching, yeah. just on such a primal level to be fed, yeah. to be literally yes. be fed by another human that you don't 
really know before that moment, perhaps. That's right. And it's clear it is the gift economy and not barter. Uh, right. Say that you are giving for giving's sake. You're giving because it feels good to give. <laughs> and it, it, and there is an exchange around. There is a, a different economy there. Uh, there there's there's a appreciation economy and there's a, a creative economy around being able to, to create so much and that and and there's a, a chance to to collaborate like it's it is a lot of fun to just go and help somebody put up the dome or or do whatever else is happening um yeah as it's needed yeah yeah and it's um i guess you know people who want to be cynical or criticize it like it's it is only for a week and yeah i don't know if that model could <laughs> apply forever for our I don't know that it can and I, yeah. I don't know that we yeah I, I don't I think there's there are ways that people get other have other needs that they want to get met that get a lot they got met a lot easier with a traditional um, money-based economy and to the extent that there are other ways to to do it without formal money I'm, I'm very intrigued um, and certainly humans were here without money money is a <laughs> fairly recent invention in our in our history Right. Um, and we give give things to monkeys and they start commodifying them and start using them to, to trade. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it does happen. But um, but I, I am intrigued by intentional communities such as Twin Oaks uh, here in Virginia that uh, uses very little money, but still it does have labor credits. So there is a commodification mm. of, of time, uh, but it, 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 it it's not with a profit motive per se or if the profit the profit is taken to be free time right and and community and other other values that support the human experience as opposed to material items as much yeah 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 i think there's a certain power in um i think a lot of people who go to burning man have the experience similar to me where like the first year i went i was just blown away i didn't know what to expect um it was challenging in a lot of ways yeah. And yeah. it's just you know, physically challenging. It's a very difficult environment. So your survival is, you know, water and shade and, like, getting sleep can be hard. Um, yeah. But then because I, I experienced so much generosity, it made me want to go back and give back. Uh -huh. I, think, I think that's, like, this ancient, like, if we want to use a more, you know, loaded <sighs> term, like, law of karma. There's something yes. about receiving that you then want to give back. And um, I think that's what lit this fire out there and what's kept it going. Oh, great. Yes, it does. Yeah, the, there's so much possibility that, that comes and people are in awe and they're like, wow, I want to come back and I have this idea. This is where I've been wanting, like, this will, this will let me do it. Like, the, there is some other transaction, some form of energy that's coming at people to know that their, their idea will especially be appreciated and engaged with uh, mm -hmm. at at Burning Man or a regional that, 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 that makes that, that continues that the cycle to have that yeah. sort of thing happen. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's invited, it's encouraged and you can go in and bring what you want, your gift or whatever it is. Yeah. And then, um, there's just, there's also something about the physical landscape, right? That it's, it's so flat and, yeah. uh, it's, it feels like, I mean, it literally is this just flat, open space, and then to see the city kind of rise up and then disappear, um, it, it's a very visceral sense of, for me at least, of emptiness. Like in the Buddhist yes. tradition, we talk about emptiness all the time, and then sure. manifestation, like these things appearing and arising through causes and conditions, right? That doesn't happen randomly. It's through people coming together and creating their vision, and then it yeah. dissolving, and it just, yeah. that's kind of how I... Think about it, you know, because I'm coming more from the Buddhist world and meditation uh -huh. and this, this like yes. emptiness and this coming into being and then this dissolving back. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the temporariness is, is key and crucial to it. I mean, as much as we'd like to continue, uh, there's a time to release. There's a time to, to let it burn. There's a time to let go of the art that we've worked so hard to create in, in the Saturday night burn that happens and <laughs> the other burns as well. Yeah. Yeah, and then that lot, that Saturday night, it's not just like the big statue the man gets burned, but all these other artworks get burned too, right? A number of other artworks get burned, and then and certainly things get taken down. Yeah, yeah. and then it clears out, <laughs> and and gets restored to uh, with the leave no trace ethic. Better oh yeah, that's another amazing part of it. It's like yeah, 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 that's the goal at least. 
<laughs> yes, that's the goal. And, and we, one way or another, we make it happen. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot of people work hard to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then, do you want to share a little bit more about, I mean, Camp Contact, we started to talk about it. It's not just contact dance. It also has authentic relating. Like ways That's that, right. So you want to speak to that? And, sure. So um, my friend Carrie Stoller um, brought authentic relating and circling to, to my attention. She had been a bit avid um, contact dancer. And she's like, Daryl, there's this relational form of dance that is called circling. And at the same time, I was doing a men's group here in D.C. with Jeffrey Platts. And he was also telling me about circling. And I was like, well, I mean, you know, it was one of these things where you get it from two different directions. Uh, <laughs> and it's just a, the, the serendipity, the, the, this, this, uh, of, of, of something coming at you is like, you got to look at this. And, mm. and so, yes, I was like, wow, this is key part of what I want to do. And I think Camp Contact would align really well with the two. So I ended up going out to the Bay Area for six weekends and taking Decker's T3 circling training to be oh, a facilitator in this realm. Oh, cool. Yeah. I did that training here in Boulder. Great. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Powerful stuff, right? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then, um, and then Camp Contact's in a village of other healing... Can't, isn't it called, it's called like a healing village, right? Uh, we call it Anahasana Village. Anahasana Village, yeah. Yeah. Or uh, sorry, is that, does that mean non-violence? Uh, Anahasana is two words. Uh, anah anahata is the heart chakra. Oh, okay. And asana is the yogic pose. So oh, that's that's Anahasana right. is the embodied heart, if you will. It is how do we let that heart be in our bodies? How do we, how do we embody <laughs> heart, heart centeredness? It's a beautiful Anahasana. name. Okay, now it's coming back to me. <laughs> yeah, it came from David Braun. That was a word that David Braun oh. came up with uh, that we used and chose as as the name of the village after a lot of different names. And um, so, yeah, David, David Braun created something called Naked Heart as a, another camp, kind of came out of Camp Contact. And and then at some point we decided we, we really wanted a crypto aspect to the camp too. I, I'm very fascinated by decentralization and, and crypto uh, blockchain-based uh, tools and, and projects. And so we also okay. have uh, yeah. Decentral as a camp in Anahasana Village these days as well, led by Griff Green. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I got to, I, I'm thankful I got to teach meditation and yoga there a bit. And it was oh, great. It's beautiful to see. One of the powerful things about Burning Man for, for some people, like if you do offer a workshop, like so many yes. people... Yes. May may show up. I guess that's not guaranteed, but there's this does. one there's this one memory I have where yeah. I was gonna go to um yoga. It was like nine in the morning and the person who was supposed to teach it didn't show up. Yeah. And there was there was probably there must have been like sixty or seventy people. It was a big group. And so I yeah. stood up and volunteered and I oh, I wow. this yoga class. Yeah. It felt, it felt so good. <laughs> uh -huh. So and this is an iconic yeah. Burning Man story right here. It's certainly an iconic camp contact on us in the village story. Um, you know, I, I, when, when I get some newbies who are, you know, good teacher, who are great teachers in the world, they're like, so, you know, can I get a dues difference uh, for like teaching or, you know, and I'm like, it's, it's kind of strange. The economy is very different there. It's a privilege to teach. Yeah. Burning Man. And, and. Yeah. It's a, where a lot of people get their start. It's, you know, I taught my first contact class at a burn uh, because the audience it is just such a pleasure to have the audience that you get for your workshops at the burns. It is, it is um, as a teacher, I certainly find, and I, from what I've heard, which sounds like what you've heard, that you get so rewarded to teach yeah. at a burn. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And then, um, so I haven't, the last time I was there was 2016. Okay. I wonder if, I wanted to ask you this, because I, I believe in my memory when I went there, I noticed for the first time in my experience, like my cell phone was kind of working. Yeah. Is that changed? How has that changed things? Are, are cell phones now working out there? There, there is coverage. Uh, it still gets pretty slow um, by the middle of the week. Uh, I think that, I mean, I think, I think the biggest thing has changed is that people have cameras closer to them and a lot more photography and video uh -huh. comes. 
more social media yeah. posting afterwards. And, and then certainly more social media posting afterwards uh, comes in that. I don't see people using phones to communicate with one another across the playa at this point. Um, I think, and, I, and yes, while you can use the phone to look up the what, where, when, and, and see different events that are happening, uh, rather than have to carry a book around with you, even then, like, people get it. People drop into the immediacy. People realize they're going to end up where they need to be, not where they think they should be. Hmm. Uh, and that, that immediacy has has not changed any to be any less of a okay. principle and a, di- and a dynamic that uh, that I love the most. The immediacy nice. is probably my favorite principle. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Okay. I was worried that the cell phones are going to ruin things to some degree. But... Not, not, I oh. wouldn't say too much. I, I, okay. It's still a very magical place. And so, yeah, immediacy is one of the, there's like the 10 principles, right? People could look them up online, but that's, that is a good one. Yep. That's a powerful yeah. one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have an 11th principle that's informal, but well agreed upon that consent is, oh. uh, is, is asking consent, asking consent to interact that's with a another good person. Is, um, is kind of the informal 11th principle that is in practice there. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to um, share a little bit? I know you know a lot about cryptocurrency. I don't know if you want to yeah. take that to share because you were saying that's part of the camp. I didn't know that, actually. Part of the, the village, I should say. Part of the yeah. village, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I've been involved with it for fairly early on. Uh, I was on the Cypherpunks email list back in uh, 2000, pardon me, back in 1998. I don't even know what that, that is. Okay. Uh, so Cypherpunks are, are people who are looking at the positive social benefits to cryptography, to the mm-hmm. use of, of cryptographic math and algorithms uh, to, to solve humanity's problems. And um, in 98, someone brought up this idea of, um, of what is now Bitcoin, uh, what is now the blockchain, and and actually okay. PayPal in its original form was looking towards building something more like Bitcoin as opposed to building uh, what PayPal has, has turned into. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Man, so anyhow, I have, a, when I, I have a love I have a love hate relationship with PayPal. <laughs> They're, they're they, I use them. I use them, and yeah. they take they take money they every time do. I use it. <laughs> they do, and and they are a company. And kind of the beauty of Bitcoin is that you can use it, but it it is not a company. Mm. It is decentralized, and and yes, there are still transaction fees, and and certainly there is the cost of um, electricity that gets used because the algorithm. While it's a very powerful algorithm, it, it's not the most um, energy efficient algorithm for these computers mm-hmm. as as the uh, the mining happens. Is that, uh, is that intentional? There's, there's more though? coming. Sorry. Is that intentional in the design of Bitcoin to make the the mining energy intensive so as to have less people able to do it or something like that? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say no. it was intentional that way. It was, I think, the, the one of the easiest, one of the most obvious ways to do it that Satoshi figured out that figured out. Um, okay. and, uh, I, I think the barriers to people using Bitcoin are more, um, around, um, mm, technical or trusting it is, it, it is, it is, right. it is complex, um, uh, architecture and, and it's not supported by the government. So it's not right. necessarily as trustworthy to, to, to a number of people. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess while I have you here, I mean, I'll yeah. reveal some of my ignorance. I, I don't know a lot about yeah. this stuff. I've I've okay. learned and read, and I've I've actually bought Bitcoin. But for me, and I imagine I a lot of people would resonate with this that the idea of using Bitcoin to purchase a service or a product or in your day to day life seems ridiculous yeah. because the whole point that people are buying it is the hopes that it will go up a bunch and they'll make right. a bunch of yes. dollars and then they'll cash out and they'll get American dollars in their bank account and they'll feel happy. Yes, <laughs> it's true. Uh, Bitcoin is a deflationary currency, so it, it doesn't actually make sense um, financially to to sell it. Uh, this whole this whole hodl uh, meme about it to buy it and never sell, mm. uh, and it, it fluctuates. It's volatile. It's very volatile. It's more, most you know, it's, it's more volatile than, than stocks are typically. It just yeah, just just yesterday went up. 
on a ridiculous amount. And it will go down just as fast mm -hmm. at, at, at times, but, but generally heading in an upward direction in the past since it's been here. Uh, and there are now cryptos that emulate the dollar. So there's a, a die or tether is another one that are on the blockchain, but they, they mirror the dollar. So they call them stable coins. And so we may start seeing people using the stable coins as a way to buy and sell things. Uh, and you won't have the fear of loss. Uh, huh. um, and, and it certainly makes it easier to denominate and not have to look up an exchange rate. Or worry right. about receiving it and then having it drop when you're in the middle of the night before you've had a chance to sell it. Well, so I mean, if someone's listening to this and they're just thinking, like, okay, that's great and all, but why would I ever actually want to actually use that versus the normal way? Like, uh, so the big the, the the big argument right now is for remittances. If if you're wanting to send value um, to uh, a relative, a friend, or a company um, in another country far away. Um, as many people do to um, immigrants may want to send money back to their home countries, uh, they have to use Western Union and they pay a significant percentage fee. And it's also a delay. Um, mm -hmm. maybe it can take two or three, four days, depending. And, and Western Union and these others have gotten better um, and it, it is moving faster, but there's still is that charge. And so you may want to send Bitcoin to your family or send a remittance using a, a crypto. Uh, I guess El Salvador has recently just adopted Bitcoin as a, um, as it's not as a, as a valid form of currency. Yeah. I heard that on another podcast. That's interesting. They were um, saying that it's threatening the IMF and all this stuff. And yes. Yeah. So knows, there's a big question yeah. around the, powerful World Bank, IMF, and, and and the Federal Reserve, and and the other reserve banks in, in Europe, and China, and so forth, and are there better ways to ma manage our money that, uh, or, or in, you use these other coins because they give us some sort of freedom different from the freedoms that we get from the central banks. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So there's, I mean, it's a complex topic. There's a lot of yeah. angles. And, and yeah. I don't know if we want to go too yeah. far into it, but yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, just to make it more simple in my own kind of more simple day to day life, if I could send money more easily, not pay a fee, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so less fee. Yeah. Less fee. Yeah. Or less and, of a fee. And much more immediate. But it doesn't sound like that's something in your realm that you've needed to do much. You, you haven't. Had to spend no, money I'm just I'm just thinking people. that like for me personally, like and I think a lot of small businesses have this. Every time someone pays with a credit card, there's a yes. fee, and that really adds there up is. over the years. It and you know, so if I could yes. reduce that in any way, I would love that. And I know I'm not alone yeah. there. So that, yeah, yeah, and that that certainly is another argument. Um, I think the benefits still of, and the convenience of credit cards are are still good enough that it doesn't. Um, Makes sense to start using DAI as your method of exchange, but that that may change. Yeah, we'll, we'll I see. Feel like eventually, eventually it will change, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, and there's talk that centralized that central banks may start issuing their own um, crypto. Um, oh, China is already doing it. China has a crypto that is based on on their their coin. Uh, we'll see what Facebook wants to do. With, with with their version of it. Oh, is Facebook developing a version? Well, so Facebook has Libra, but then they've changed the name to something else. I'm not remembering oh. recently. And uh, Diem, I think they're calling it, is the new name. And and so we'll, well, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, we don't have to spend too much time on this, so that's no. interesting to hear yeah. a little bit about it. And, yep. Uh, that's a part of that village there. Um, it just seems like, I guess there's a big connection with, I mean, the first time I heard about Bitcoin was at Burning Man, so there's some Good. connection going there. I'm not sure if, yes, there like, how that happened, but yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think there's a lot of burners uh, who are fascinated. It just kind of matches the personality. The mm. DIY sort of thing is, you know, Bitcoin's DIY money at some, or Ethereum is DIY money or com DIY contracts. Yeah. Uh, it's programmable money that people can make, make work in different ways. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then, um, 
guess the other thing on my list of questions to ask you that I feel I would be amiss if I didn't is we've had a number of podcast episodes about psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy and that whole realm. Yeah. And as soon as people think of Burning Man, that's a big part of what they think about too, that it's a place where there's psychedelic influenced art, music, um, it just seems like a big part of the culture. And I think part of how things have become, I think on the positive side, it's, it's helped progress our, our culture to talking about these more things more openly. And so towards the legalization movement that's happening, ending the war on drugs, yes. um, all that stuff, which is, which yes. is great. And then in the yes. therapeutic realm, there's so much excitement yes. and enthusiasm around yes. psychedelic assisted therapy. And so, yeah, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Like, how do you understand that? Um, sure. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of, lot of possibilities here, a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and it is exciting to see the various, um, jurisdictions, uh, legalizing cannabis and then now legalizing other plant medicines. Mm -hmm. And it's also nice to see that, uh, that things like ayahuasca are being treated uh, as something that could be used uh, with religious freedom. Right. And so we, we do see a lot of different ayahuasca ceremonies happening uh, throughout the world and, and including in the U.S. And I, I think that for the most part, there is a lot of healing and transformation and, and release that, that can can happen with, with uh, DMT, the active ingredient in ay ayahuasca. Hmm. Um, so I, who would have thought that this would be be happening? Yeah, but it, it is it is finally starting to happen. And, and yeah, Johns Hopkins right here on the DC area is doing a, oh, yeah. a lot of research. Yeah, they've been one of the around. top schools. Yep. Yeah. And then a lot of therapists here are getting training from Maps, which is in your oh, neck cool. of the woods, or yeah, right back there. Um, Rick Doblin um, is, has done a lot. I know he just got interviewed recently. I need to listen to his podcast. Um, yeah. Yeah, he's and, been such an active person. On, he's uh, so many interviews and so much publicity and so much good yes. research and science and um, and just being really honest about where the science and research are at. You know, it's not a yes. magic bullet. It's not a cure all, but it can can be really helpful um, in the right situation and context. Yeah, it's amazing. Right. Twenty twenty one, like this. This I've just witnessed this uh, tidal wave turn, like the 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 force of gravity shift from this war on drugs mentality to yes. what we're talking about now. And it's, it's becoming, yeah. you know, Michael Pollan's book, um, yes. how to change your mind was a, yeah. hu is a huge part of that. But yes. I, I, I really believe that, um, Burning Man, Black Rock city, 80,000 people coming together in peace and harmony for the most part, right? 99.9% .9 yeah. of the experience there is nonviolent and peaceful. And yeah. I would say, and, um, people know that that's happening and that that's a space where people are experimenting. And, and so they can, it just kind of proves that, the, some of these substances that have been so demonized yes. are not turning people into uh, crazy, horrible maniacs or whatever the fear is. Sure. Well, and I, I think the, the big problem is that there, there was just this overarching thing, like just say no to drugs. Uh, right, like it's one 80, thing. It's 90, this monolithic, yeah. It's monolithic thing, which is certainly how I grew up and, and how I understood drugs, illicit drugs to be for the, for the longest time. Hmm. And yes, because there, there are some, the, the opioids are, are horrible. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the kind of paradox is that it turns out the opioids have come through very legitimate channels, like causing right. more problems. You know, that's a, that's a really good point. And it's, yeah. um, it's an important one. And uh, something I've talked a bit about on the podcast, but I'm going to like devote some more episodes to this, but that there's... Right. There's a re there's really good reasons why people distrust the big pharmaceutical companies and yes. distrust some of the medical establishment and yes. part of it is that part of it is the opioid crisis that yeah, the worst absolutely. drugs and worst addiction problem we've had as a culture has come out through these pills that then yes. people turn to heroin and yes. you know, the other so the other class of drugs that I believe is the most difficult to get off of are the benzos yeah and uh, I don't yeah. have personal experience with that but I worked at a um, rehab center and okay. so i got to witness this and like that i mean it's just unbelievable how like people are taking things like xanax or whatever it is if for someone who's truly addicted to that kind of uh substance it is a very very difficult very gnarly to get off and yeah. you, need, you need you really need medical support there you can't really you know so it's just, right. 
Yeah, and that's yeah. those are those are also drugs that are produced by pharmaceutical companies. They can help yep. people. They can be prescribed legitimately, but we we seem like we're a very over prescribed society. <laughs> we we are, and there there are good things there, and there's definitely we want oversight for, for the very the, the very dangerous ones or the ones that have risk. Uh, but I, the, I I think the other thing that happens is that because you can't patent plant medicines, you. There's no way for pharmaceutical companies to make loads of profit off of something that's in nature that's already been been here for like, you know, <laughs> uh, millennia, and and so that there's a they're, they're they were happy to make those bad, right? And then because they didn't because they also didn't make money when they actually do have some healing properties that, and and they're not they're not specifically addictive. They're, I mean, there may be some rare cases of psychological addiction. For some of them, but they're not they're not addictive the way the opioids and and perhaps the benzos or the the stimulants are. Yeah, and there's I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's been some attempts to patent aspects of psychedelic therapy and, and like uh, some of the like, yeah people. They, I mean, I'm not surprised they tried. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, I mean so the big question for me then and that is like how do we as communities and societies work to work with nature and and yeah. not you no know, capitalism certainly is, is not going away and and it, there's lots of good ways that money flowing allows for some things to happen but there's this really sp more specific relationship i want to see that people can have uh with money that allows them to um not be exploited by it and and not exploit society with it either right that's a good point which, which, which makes me want to really have something called wants to have universal basic income happen. So that's that's a oh, big cool. thing for me. Like that if we be, all yeah. could agree to give everybody a chunk of money just for being alive, and and see how it it impacts people's anxiety levels, uh, and let them then work for the comforts, the luxury in their lives. Uh, I, I think we might have all around a win-win-win, omni-win situation for us. But something about the independent mentality uh, of, of the United States doesn't allow for that. And, and that's where I want to see the both and. I still want people to be sovereign and independent in ways, but also be able to yeah. know that they've got some sort of safety net that will... Because there is value in life. There's value in staying healthy. And there's value in not having a ton of anxiety in anybody that's yeah. around us. But Absolutely. I, but people don't... People, anxiety is not something that, that in other people that we care enough about. Hmm. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah, I, I just remembered. So there's this company called Compass Pathways that tried to patent... Okay. Or they're trying to patent, I guess, still. Okay. Uh, psilocybin, but then they like filed patent claims for like having soft furniture and like ambient music and like things like that. It's just ridiculous. Oh, uh, I don't do it. Yeah. Please don't get me started on, um, on the whole patent situation. And, a, oh, really? And, uh, some of the well, challenges I, just, I deal with that. Yeah. I wanted to say, um, I just, yeah, you just said a lot. I mean, I wanted to like, I, so I think if I got in my soapbox here, like having the for-profit motive in our medical system has a uh, huge negative consequences. And I think we have seen, we are seeing the results of some of these negative consequences in uh, the coronavirus, the, the pandemic that we've been facing, because we, when we have the institu institutional trust, you know, degraded through things like the opioid crisis and, and just the sense that the medical establishment is constantly, you know, trying to get as much money out of you as they can, the insurance yeah. companies, the doctors, like that's not a good relationship that we want to have with our personal health. And so... Yeah, so I mean that's just a big subject, but I think um, you spoke to the anxiety that people feel because in order to be a living, breathing, healthy human being in the United States in the year 2021, I need to be making thousands of dollars. And if I don't make those thousands of dollars, I can't buy healthy food, I can't go see my doctor, I can't pay my insurance, I can't pay my bills. And there's this level of ambient anxiety that, I, that people you. feel. And I, I have clients that I work with as a therapist who... Yeah. They're getting paid uh, fifteen dollars an hour, okay. And they have trouble, you know. They're paying a thousand dollars or nine hundred dollars a month in rent. Like they, yeah. 
I feel bad taking money from them for therapy, even though it's helping them. I bet. Just because, yeah. um, so I offer a sliding scale or whatever, but the point right. is, in order for them to, like, they're just living with this, like, kind of existential anxiety that's in the richest society in the history of the world is so unnecessary, you know? Yes. And so the universal basic income, I think, is a good idea, but um, we need to figure something out, and we need to, like, the long, it's like there's all these situations where the long-term impacts uh, are so negative, like like the preventative medicine, the preventative <coughs> eating, health, eating healthy from a young age, like that prevents yes. so much negative yes. stuff down the road. Uh, to have a medical system that in some weird twisted sense has a profit motive to like let people get sick so that they can then do expensive treatments on them. Right. 50, 60 years old. It's so fucked up. It's so terrible. Right. Why would we do this? <laughs> Why would we do why this? Do, why would why, we create well, a society this way? Yeah, and that's, I mean, the, the big problem there is that we use GDP to measure how well an economy is working. But GDP counts every kind of economic financial transaction as a good thing, including money we spend on alarm systems, money that we spend on policing, money that we spend on weapons, mm-hmm. money that we spend on, on, um, on coronary on, on on heart transplants or heart heart bypasses and diabetes medicine and everything else, rather than looking at the progress indicators, that is just the spending, or it's just the economic activity that allows for the good things of life, the, the valuable things. So, yeah. So it's, it's a problem that we have to spend more and more money on policing. Our goal should be to put the police generally out of, out of, out of business uh, well, or, yeah. or not to and need we would them need, as much. need less of them. Yeah. We need less of them. And I, you know, if we need them, let's have them, of course, but let's have them trained in a way that they're putting themselves out of business hmm. uh, or, and same for the fire departments, the fire, you know, we should be working really hard and, and they do, there's fire prevention divisions and that's great. They make sure we get smoke detectors and have codes that require, sprinklers and, and alarms and, and all that and and a lot and we've made a lot a lot of headway in that in in, in different realms um yeah but well, so part of part of your point is that in our economic system now it doesn't yeah. differentiate money spent towards things that we really would rather not be spending money on in terms of our goodness and overall happiness versus you know right. money spent towards those things like those are good examples yeah. and you've heard about bhutan and, yeah. Uh, yeah they have the gross domestic happiness quotient and that's that is the, their their metric for deciding whether to move with some policy or not, or how to how to optimize their lives. Yeah, I've heard about that, and I think Holland too is using that. Um, right. A lot of these like northern like Scandinavian countries seem like they rank high on this. Denmark on is, is doing great. Yeah. Yep. Love it there. Love love these ideas. It just it seems like. Um, seems to me like like talking about Denmark or Bhutan like it's beautiful but then people are like this is the real world here in America and and like it just seems like we have uh unleashed this gigantic monster that is insatiable appetite desire greed yeah and um even the people like the Elon Musk, whatever uh, Jeff Bezos of the world it's like sure. they never have enough no one ever has enough no, no and, they're, um, well, they are they are addicted yeah yeah, yeah that's, addiction, that's exactly yeah there's an interaction between addiction and capitalism yeah. Where there are certain groups of people, um, the one percent typically that are somehow uh, addicted to to more more dollars or more more economic activity or more ownership of property, and um, yeah. I, I, I I'd like to see that treated. <laughs> I'd like to see <laughs> that uh, you know willingly, but but I'd I'd like people to figure out other ways of getting their needs met to not mm. have to have as much control. And that, and that's, that's what I love about Burning Man and being a leader of a camp. You know, I, I love things happening, but I love that they happen because other people are doing them mm. <laughs> and leading them and being that and being that. And, and so you know, my goal is to be the strongest base I can to allow that many more things to happen and other people to be the rock stars of making things happen. Hmm. Um, rather than uh, growing some sort of um, financial empire. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was, um, 
the last year I was there, 2016, there was a lot of talk about like um, billionaires coming to Burning Man and they were going to ruin it all. And I wonder yeah. if uh, I hold out some hope that some people like you're describing who are in that realm could actually experience something there that really touches their heart and maybe yeah. move them to make positive changes in the world or think about things differently or understand yeah. the true value of human life differently. Sure. Yeah. The there is, I hope that that happens. I, I hope that there are interactions that allow for deeper meaning to come. Um, I, I, I think there are ways that a lot of needs, un, unknown needs get met at Burning Man mm. that then maybe people can take that back to their lives and say, oh, you know, I don't need to make myself feel better by buying this other piece of property or boat or going on this other thing. I'm going to make myself feel better by supporting some way of creating something else that allows other, uh, some artists to create or so I, I, yeah, whatever it's like, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Uh, all that. I mean, and we should come up with better vocabulary for what that is, Julian. I like that. I like how you're bringing it down to getting needs met and there are different needs that we might not even realize we have like around contact, camp contact, yes. uh, human touch, authentic relating. Yes. Uh, like art, uh, creativity, like these, you know, Things that make life worth living, right? Like <laughs> they are, because we're we're filling voids a lot of times with mm. our, our spending, and I, I do it. I I certainly certainly um spend uh re do retail therapy. I, I catch it in myself. I'm like, what is this yeah. about, Daryl? What what else? What else? What else do you need? Yeah, if I, yeah, <laughs> I do that too. Sometimes okay. it's not good. All right, it's so easy, so easy now. Yeah. Well, and what if you know, like right now, bars and bartenders are trained like. Hey, you, you can't have another drink, Julian. You've you've had enough. You know, where you're drunk. Like this is. We, we'll give you here. Here, have a, have a, just a soda. It's beer, but it's not really beer. You know, what if? And again, this is the whole freedom. Where is the freedom? Where is the where is the authoritarianism that is so feared by the by the right? I, I don't necessarily want that. But what if there were ways of apps that were voluntarily engaged in that? Cut us off when we're eating too much um, diabetic-inducing food, mm. um, or you know, made us weigh something, or check our BMI before we have that that calorie-laden burger. Mm. Uh, the, the way I bar and or buy something else. Like, what if there was a way to have mm. more information than just dollars in being included in how transactions happen? And it's a very scary subject, and I yeah. don't want that coming top down. I want it bottom up. Right. I want it from peers. I want it from community. I don't want it from some authoritarian space. Um, yeah, I don't want. Yeah, I don't think. I don't. I don't think an authoritarian approach would work. The thing that came to my mind. It won't. Yeah, it won't. Work. Oh, you want to? You want to see another civil war? Right. Uh, it won't. And and there'll be people. Uh, uh, bypassing it in lots of ways mm. and bribing out of it or whatever, which I really? don't, certainly don't want to see that either. I, I want more transparency and more honesty. Um, but where, where more conversations and more stakeholders can, can be a part of it. Uh, you know, and then that certainly some of that happens when you want to build a building, you have to ask the neighbors, right. hey, can this building be here? And there's whole NIMBY stuff and all that. And, you know, people have, have certain rights in the commons uh, and then neighboring stuff, you know, what if you, if to buy a house, you had to meet all the neighbors and see if the neighbors liked you the same way that if you go to a group house, you got to meet all the people in the group house to meet in the group <laughs> house or not. Yeah. Um, I yeah, just, I want more people to have say in certain things, but without, but yeah. More people without have more say, all. cause it affects all of us, right? Like, yeah, it, it does. It does. We and and some, our democratic voting it. systems are not, are not, always is i think there's better ways of representation than the standard voting systems that we've got now yeah you know the thing that came to mind when you're talking is like a healthy community like being seen and witnessed in community by other people that you care about that care about you i think that yeah. to some degree or another we we actually do have that here and humans oh. have always lived in communities and and those communal forces when they're working well there's a sense of guilt or shame that could actually be positive. Like if you do something wrong or bad, like if I throw a piece of trash on the ground and someone sees me, I'm going to feel bad about it for just to yes. make up an example. 
yeah. that kind of impulse, you know, can be leveraged towards healthy, more optimal ways of being. And then I, I see with some people, like when you enter more extreme wealth, you get richer and richer. There is then an impulse to isolate yourself more and more, which is that addictive yes. piece you're speaking to. It's not healthy, but it's because, you know, it's just you want to protect what you have, but then you end up cutting yourself off from other people. You buy right. the giant mansion with all the land around it, but then it takes 30 minutes to get to your house and no one comes and knocks on your door. So there's well, like. <laughs> yeah, so do you know Rene Girard? Uh -huh. He talks about um, mimetic desire yeah. and. There is something about anytime you're around somebody with a certain piece of, uh, of, of some value, then there's a natural jealousy or a natural desire for that Porsche or for, for that Lamborghini or whatever else. And then it actually gets in the way of the relationship, as you, as you described, because I'm like, oh, why, you know, I, I want that too. And so it is, it is hard. It, it can be hard to be around other people of, of certain different classes uh, be, because of, of, of desire. And then, and so I, I know I've, I've certainly had to like not talk about something of value that I do or don't have. Mm -hmm. And I also know that it, it works the other way where I'm, I, I feel myself around and, and Facebook does a lot of this. Right. We start seeing everybody's vacations and you start feeling like, well, why am I not going to, to this remote island or why am I not going to Hawaii, you know, wherever it is for the mountains or not taking all those vacations. I see that. So, so Facebook and these other and social media have, have like leveled the, not leveled the playing field, but it, it changed the dynamic in huge ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one. <laughs> I think social media, it tends to be like more of a trying to portray a certain lifestyle almost or, I don't know. It is. And, and then other people can find people more in line with that lifestyle because of it or not. Yeah. Uh, but it's, 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 it's interspersed with so many other heavy things between just finding something fun to do on a weekend to finding a group uh, that has conversations about something you're interested in. Um, right. And the social dilemma is great. as a great movie. You know, just oh yeah, that was on our that was on our list of things to talk about. I'm glad that's coming up. So oh good, okay. But like um, social media, obviously, I think as good and bad, and it's been talked about a lot. And I think um, what was I going to say? Oh, I think this is another great example, important area where the profit motive kind of is poisoning the well that we're drinking it from. Is. If we could have social media, Facebook, let me see what my friends are doing, my family, without the profit motive that's making Facebook algorithm pop up this thing that disturbs me, that makes me react to it, that makes yeah. me click on a link that sells yeah. me an ad to this to all of a sudden I'm on a website trying to sell me a gun or something. I'm like, what am I, what that's happened? Right. That's right. That's right. You know, oh, look, Joe's, your Joe, your friend Joe's got a gun. Like, Oh, I got to go. He went out shooting. Wow. I think I got to go do that too. Like I wouldn't have done it otherwise, but <laughs> I don't know why that example popped in my head. I guess YouTube ads. That's where it got me one time. Yeah. All of a sudden on YouTube, there's these ads popping up. I'm like, Okay, I searched this in a website the other day, and now it's popping up here, and it's just so bizarre. Oh, it's it's wild, and it and it's 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 stretching our country to its limits. Yeah, it really yeah. messes with our mind because it's it's operating on this deeper level in our minds, I think, than we're yeah. you know able to deal with. We didn't evolve to deal with this kind of a thing. No, well, the inf inf the information, the um, epistemic commons is what they call it. The, the, the truth, the body of truth that we carry. Uh, as a com as a valuable uh, product, a common is is getting polluted. It, it, yeah, and and is getting stretched so that uh, out of a profit motive, so that more people buy or use or, or go out and do something that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Yeah, and and it's not all bad. There's definitely education and information, and people are finding themselves and getting validated for who they really are, whatever that means, uh, because they found something that the algorithm did recommend that makes their lives better, but yeah, it can be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel some of these pressures, um, since I cr do this podcast, right. And I've actually okay. reflected on this and I've, I make it a practice. Like before I start recording, like try to check in and have a positive motivation, thinking about the people I'm talking to and, and share from my heart. But there is a, you know, like if I could stir up some controversy or do this or that, yeah. like if I wanted to build up the numbers of listeners. And so I'm really trying to not come right. from that place, but I feel that, yeah. you know, that's in the air. It's in the atmosphere. How do, 
Yes. That's a, I love this question, Julian. So how <laughs> do you decide, like, what if there was some other person you could have on or some topic you could address that you know would get more viewers, hmm. but yet is that really in the realm of some deeper um, aesthetic or ethic or yeah. vision that you want to maintain that keeps you from doing that? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, and it's good to look at. And I th- one one area where I've seen that happen, and it almost feels like an earthquake, where like there's a fault line, and different people fell on one side or the other. But it's around COVID, the pandemic, vaccines, and mostly stayed away from that on the podcast. But I've just seen people in the health and wellness and yoga world kind of jump off the deep end, okay. and um, I've seen other people go the other way of like, well, we should all you know the more mainstream narrative, so to speak. I don't even want to get into it all on here too much, but just that that okay. issue has been so divisive. I can at least say that. I, and, I, um, yeah, I'd love for you a to lot do of misinformation a podcast <laughs> yeah. around that for yourself. I would, yeah. yeah. I mean, my brother is a, is a medical doctor, and he actually um, he got like a master's in public health before going to medical school, and he studied yeah. vaccines and um, ways to improve health in third world countries and stuff like that. And so... When I listen to him talk, like as someone who actually studied this in school, who is in the lab, like looking at this stuff in a microscope, at, at yeah. least in the past he was, yeah. I'm like, okay, this guy like actually has like spent the time and energy. He's not just listening to a YouTube video and then like going on, you know? Yeah. So from, from his point of view, this vaccine that we have for COVID is a miracle and we should all be yeah. taking it basically. I, you know? I think there's a lot to be said for that truth. And what, like that's the epistemic comments. When right. polio was here, it was quite clear to take the vaccines. And, and probably there were a few cases where the polio vaccine hurt some people. I, maybe right. killed them. I don't know. I'd love to know more about the history of that. It's not but perfect, but it's, yeah. No, nothing is going to be. We're all, nothing yeah. is, is going to be. Um, but there is now a profit motive or an attention yes. gathering motive around saying conflictual information. Right. Uh, that pollutes our epistemic common. <laughs> and then I'm going to sell you my supplement or something that's going to cure you. That's, <laughs> there you go. And then, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. And we do want free, we do want dialogue. We do want, we don't want to like stop that, but where are those limits and yeah. what are the measures? So I, I hope, and I, I think that we can find better ways of, of measuring the other forms of capital that are in part of anything else. And I, I'll just hold them up here. So this, this is a, a deck of cards uh, that's just sitting on my desk that um, looks at the 10 different forms of capital. Hmm. Uh, and, and so there's social capital, psychological capital, educational capital, uh, and financial capital, and, and, and a, few, a few others. Like, how can we all better think about the different forms of capital huh. that are being exchanged in any interaction not just uh, not, not just the money aspect to make decisions about whether we want to make that transaction happen or not, and how can we make more transactions happen necessarily with with less money mm. or with with um, other ways of getting those the needs that we were talking about earlier in this conversation getting met. Right, that's cool. It's called a wisdom tech. The, this is the wisdom economy. It's a group. wisdom economy. It's a, it's a, a group called Meta Integral. We'll put it in the link in the show notes. Uh, but they do consulting and, and they have examples of, of how to better address a given project um, full impact. What is, what is the impact across all the different dimensions rather well, than, uh, oh, I'm going to make this much money. This is you know, profit and loss and this is a good investment. And you know, who cares what really happens? It just... Like, right. you really want to, we want to start thinking about the environmental impacts and all, all, all the rest, social impacts of a given endeavor. Uh, so we really do end up getting our needs met, which are no, <laughs> which are less and less getting, getting met by just having a chunk of money. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't expect our conversation to go in this direction, but you're the information commons, this, um, yeah, metaphor absolutely. or idea of the tragedy of the commons, you know, like yeah, I remember learning right. about that in high school or something. That's oh, yeah. like so yeah. 
pertinent, so powerful, so relevant. And yeah. it's like what we're experiencing on, I mean, the global warming, right? Like that we, yes. we can offlay these costs to the collective so that the individual or company profits. And then over yeah. time, it just, it's not sustainable. That's right. It's, yeah. So and a lot of this is coming from um, me being in front of the Zoom calls of the STOA. Uh, it's an oh, online oh. site. We'll oh, cool. Yeah. And in particular, Daniel Schmachtenberger and Tristan yeah. Harris uh, of the um, of Undivided Attention podcast, mm -hmm. Your Undivided Attention, and uh, and this other fellow, Forrest Landry, and, and many others uh, around the Game B communities that are all kind of do, doing a lot of great research around how, how can we engage in non-rivalrous dynamics. So yeah, I appreciate you naming those those communities and those people, and, and this is an exciting conversation that is worth joining. You know, it involves affects all of us. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's certainly been a lot of good stuff that's come out of the pandemic as well, where people have had a chance to think about what's more important to them, and and certainly yeah. all the other social social transformation, social upheaval, social um, events of the of the 2020. Uh, been huge for us. Yeah, yeah. I think your your point about like looking at our needs and where they're getting met, and um, the pandemic gave us a chance to like kind of get a fresh perspective on a lot of that, and you know, uh, for better or worse, at, you know. Yeah, we um, you know, we look at a we look at a bottle and we see what what uh, or we look at a, a food and we see what kind of nutrients it gives us. I have a fantasy that someday we're going to be able to look at it, an interaction, and and kind of get to know. Or, or, or just know that a certain person has a certain measurable or at least qualita quantitative, qualitative, or quantitative and qualitative aspects to them that are um, supporting us. And then we'll, 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 we'll better, better be able to go to a therapist mm. and you'll be able to say, you know, this is a need or this is a, a value that is being neglected. You know, when we see the list of needs that people have from a nonviolent communication perspective. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Do you ever get to that place as a, as a, as a therapist where you're saying, wow, you need more of this sort of interaction or this sort of appreciation or this sort of, um, yeah. Psychological part of their life. Um, yeah, I think so. I, it depends a lot on the person, and I think it's a lot of helping the individual person kind of make their own discoveries and mm -hmm. insights. But, yeah, you know, something that popped in my mind, talking about the pandemic, like rates of addiction have, have gone up more or, you know, alcohol consumption went up more, all yeah. this stuff. And so yeah. Gabor Mate is a great uh, psychologist. You know, he, t he has this great yeah. saying that the opposite of addiction is connection and the yes, come back to is. camp contact to make that yeah. connection. And um, yeah. if you can get to a place where you can kind of start to slow down and bring mindfulness in and question like, okay, it's another night. I'm on Netflix. I'm, I want to have another drink. Like what's going on there? And what need is that really fulfilling? Yeah. And is there a better way where it could be fulfilled where you actually will feel better? And like, if it's connection, so like, that. yeah. So want to have, um, these other things and, and, and tracking devices, personal tracking devices that we mm. control, which, oh, you good. know, we have a little bit, you know, we have, have some things like insight timer or, Right. On these others that measure how much, um, what our heart rate variability is. That's interesting that you're mentioning that, that like some of these tech technological things, like uh, people are wearing like straps around their wrists that measure your heart rate and help you. They can help you have better sleep or they can help you be that's more right. aware of your sleep patterns. And that's right. It'd be interesting if that extended to the realm of like you're opening up the fridge for a beer or something and it like beeps at you and it's like, hey, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be interesting. I, I love it. I hope so. I hope we have smart fridges someday and, um, and all the rest. Yeah. Just to, yeah, just to bring more awareness to it, right? Not to control yeah. you or, or something like that. It does need, it, it does need to be something we opt into and use as a tool. Um, and I, I hope that it's built in a way that as community members want to have access to it, um, or we can give it to them. Uh, and I, and I, what I really want to start seeing more of is trust and transparency. You know, everybody's scared about our surveillance state and mm -hmm. like other people knowing stuff about them. There's good reasons for that because, uh, certainly the surveillance that, that the social media networks do is, is, um, 
is atrocious and is it yeah. is dangerous and and is allowing them to have a lot of control over that. But yet we still do it. We, we don't stop. <laughs> we, we're addicted. Yeah, we can't stop. Yeah, well, and we but we could be using Scuttlebutt, for instance. Scuttlebutt is a decentralized social network uh, oh. that's growing slowly. Um, it takes a little bit to set up, but it is something that you can get on your your mobile device and on your on your PC. Yeah. But there's no algorithm, or the algorithm that's there is open source. So it, it is uh, intriguing how the articles I read there are not like I can't I don't get sucked in I get sucked oh, in a little bit no that's interesting yeah um, so but there's just not enough awareness of people to even think that they could like I, pre I prefer if we don't have to use rely on the state so much to solve these problems I really want um, people to be aware enough to to know to take care of themselves but I yeah I don't know that that's always as possible as I'd like it to be. Hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, okay, yeah, while I have you, because you're more of a tech person. Yes. Would it be accurate to say that, for example, I, I tend to think, okay, the social media, the websites, they are tracking me, and um, that sucks, and rather than not. But at the yeah. same time, there's... They're not looking, no one is able to look at me as an individual and see what I'm actually doing because it's this gigantic collection of data. Is that accurate or is that not accurate way to look at it? Uh, like if, if, if someone in one of those companies had a personal thing for someone, could they uh, actually target that person if they wanted uh, to? Oh, I see. Uh, I mean, to the extent that there's data, yes. Like if, if, if there's some, some well, way that they decide Julian Royce is is a person of interest for, for whatever reason, uh, there's all any number of databases out there where you, you, you show up in it. Right. And it's they, scary it, to think about it. It is. Um, yeah. But I, but that's not the biggest fear. I, I think my biggest fear is around the overall mass, the data mining, data analytic right. work that can happen. And the the ocean is it is it ocean is a psychological profile for somebody. Yeah. In 2016 election, they were like specifically looking at people were taking the test to like learn what their profile was, but at right. the same time they took that profile information and then send targeted ads to manipulate them. Oh uh, to god, that's so play. fascinating. I appreciate you bringing that up. I vaguely heard something about that. I didn't look into it. I want to look into that more. But yeah, ocean. Yeah. I mean, that's like one of the most studied research-based ways of looking at personality openness uh, conscientiousness extroversion yeah. agreeableness neuroticism there you and go. where we all land on that spectrum can tell you a lot about a person and yeah. it's not a good or bad thing it's a scientific you know objective yeah. measurement um, but then for that to be used for political purposes because yeah. for example people who are more conservative tend to be more uh what is it well people who are more liberal tend to be more open have more openness to experience yeah. and people sure. who are conservative tend to be lower in the openness and yeah. Um, that's interesting. Phew. <laughs> well, I thought of one other thing that I was going to mention. Yes. We're getting, I know we're getting near the end of our time. But before we started recording, you were telling me that you reached your 5,000 person limit on Facebook and that wasn't enough for you. And that kind of blew my mind. So I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you're, you're the only I, person I know who like needs more than 5,000 people. On. You know, there's, there's other, well, there's others. Um, but, and a lot of them are, are, I guess, bigger celebrities at some point where people know them i've worked really hard to not necessarily be as much of a celebrity i mean i certainly like so, some <laughs> some attention but i but i much rather have more one-on-one -on -one or one on a, a, a few um group interactions and, and just knowing a lot of different people and i i'm a collector i'm i and i have hoarding tendencies and <laughs> one of the things i i do hoard are French friend, like Facebook friends. And, and so, and I, and I like, you know, digging back and remembering friends from high school or even, even further back, but, and from college and from other, other times in my life. But then I also like meeting people briefly and certainly at Burning Man, there's no shortage of amazing people that want to meet and stay in touch really? with. So there, there, there's that. So it filled up for you. Yeah. It filled up pretty fast. And it was, and then, you know, eventually you find, oh, there's some spam accounts that you've friended and there's some people you really don't know. 
and that. And then I also want to segment a little bit. Like I did have a more professional uh, profile and a more technical community. And then I had another profile that was much more of a uh, of a Burning Man profile where I, I was really? in touch with a lot of people here in the D.C. area and up and down the Mid-Atlantic from the different events I would go to. And then people in the desert and California. And um, yeah, they the two the two other side accounts uh, ended up getting shut down. Um, hmm. I'm sorry. And, and I, I I probably was doing something a li- slightly nefarious around trying to like add more likes, uh, violating this, this, you know the idea that you, you know that, that that you're supposed to just be one person on the internet. But I would much I'd be much happier to have these connections and. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I love yeah. doing genealogy and there's a way that I just, I want to know everybody that I've ever kind of been in, in contact with. I think this stuff is, is fascinating yeah, information cool. and, yeah. and it will be important to like look at our social graphs later on. So I, yes, I, I, I'm a fan and I don't necessarily want Facebook doing it. I wish I could do it with my own open source tools and maybe someday mm. that, that can happen. Yeah. Uh, but yes. Well, that's, that's interesting. I think for someone in your, you know, who's so involved with community and community organizing. Yes. It makes, it makes sense. Uh, also it makes sense to me that like we have different parts of ourselves and we could have a different social media presence for, for different parts, like you, yeah. more business yeah. side, the, the more That's social right. side, the more, I mean, there, it could go a lot of different ways. You could be interested in a certain community that you might not want other people to know that you're that's right. part yes. of it. And yeah. uh, that's legit. Yeah. I think that's legitimate. I think we should be able to oh, do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, Some so. people can't handle it. Some people, I, I wish, People could handle knowing uh, certain aspects of everybody, but it, it can be thought of as problematic, offensive, and some stuff is. <laughs> I, mean, I certainly would think it would, I, would be offensive, and I, and and so my point there is I want people to get better at dealing with the toxic sides that all of us have. Hmm. That's uh, yeah, and and appreciating them and knowing how to protect themselves from them, and not totally seeing that person as a total hazard and mm. you, there's some things that are so egregious that you just can't ever do that. Or at least most people don't know how to handle that or it takes a lot of extra work to do, but where are those lines and, and how can we do better? <laughs> That's a great uh, question. And maybe we could do that. Another talk more That'd about that good. another episode, but that, plan on that. This is, this that is we all have, we all have good and bad. We all have light and dark. We all have different sides of ourselves and to, do. humanize ourselves and it sounds it seems like a tall order for social media but to actually share more fully you know be more authentic well and it's about accountability great. how do we hold yeah. how do we we need better skills to hold people accountable mm. for their shadow sides that are not appropriate that are that are that are we yeah. need better understandings like, how to like deal with our dark sides right and to be able to hold from my point of view to be able to hold people accountable in community without totally Casting what what is there casting them off forever? That's right. Without the cancel culture stuff. Without uh, the cancel that would, culture. That's my that's my ideal. That's right. Yes. Because <laughs> we all make and mistakes. Yeah. We right. do. And there's always going to be an exception where it's just like right. no one knows how to deal with it. This person really does need, you know, at, uh, at least for a time. I don't know somehow to be right. canceled. I yeah, that's a good point. Like to tell. Oh. Yeah. Never yeah, that could be that could be totally legitimate for some people, but that would be I would hope it would be a more a extreme steps. extreme a things. Yeah. A lot of yeah. steps yeah. in the middle. Yeah. 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 Oh great. Well it's been great having you on the podcast. This is a really rich conversation. It'll be fun to write up the show notes because we covered so much ground. Um, okay. Do you have any last thoughts for us? No, I, I enjoyed this a lot, Julian. I thanks so much for reaching out to me and giving me the opportunity to, to share a lot. I, I um I, I I definitely um, felt good and, and want to do more okay. of this with, with you and, and with other people. So see what wants awesome. to happen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care.